Is 512 gigabytes good enough for the M2 Pro Mac Mini? In this video, I'm gonna help answer that question from a content creation standpoint, both as a video editor and producer and as a music producer that uses Logic Pro. Now, full context, I'm transitioning from a M1 Max MacBook Pro, a one terabyte version of that, down to an M2 Pro Mac Mini. Why? Uh, that's a completely different video, but long story short, I was missing a desktop solution for my studio here. I, while I enjoyed the laptop solution, while I enjoyed having the M1 Max MacBook Pro, I found that I didn't really use it in this space. I was constantly on the couch, I was in the backyard, I was in other places being creative as opposed to where I want to be creative, which is right here where I want to make music and where I want to edit videos and utilize the space that I have. And I realized I could have done that with the laptop, but having the freedom to move from one room to the other I took full advantage of it and I just didn't have the discipline to stay in this room. Hence desktop solution and hence going back to the Mac mini, a machine that I had back in the M1 Mac mini days back in 2020 that I absolutely loved. And to be honest with you, ever since I sold it and moved on to the M1 Max MacBook Pro, I actually missed it. And I actually was thinking about ways that I can incorporate it back into my setup. Fast forward a couple years and Apple introduces the M2 Pro version of the Mac mini and I instantly fall in love. From there, B&H has a sale where it's $200 off and using the PayBoo card, I saved myself some tax. So all in, I got the M2 Pro Mac mini, the 512 gigabyte version with 16 gigabytes of RAM, unified memory, if you will, for just $10.99, for just under $1,100. But you don't care about any of that. You care about is 512 gigabytes good enough for the M2 Pro Mac mini? And my answer is sort of. See, this is the first time in a long time that I've had a computer under one terabyte of internal memory. Cutting it down in half is a big ask. It's a big undertaking, especially when you're someone like me who has curated plugins, virtual instruments, transitions and effects over the last 10 to 15 years. See, I primarily work in Final Cut and in Logic Pro. And while Final Cut is pretty easy, I've accumulated some transitions, I've accumulated some effects here and there, but nothing that actually takes up a huge amount of disk space. Logic Pro is a completely different story. The sound library for Logic Pro alone is about 60 gigabytes if you download absolutely everything. And then aside from that, I've collected a mountain of plugins and virtual instruments over the years that have become instrumental in my music creation. These include content from native instruments, including Contact, which alone houses hybrid keys, the Grandeur Piano, which is my favorite piano sound, the Gentleman Piano Sound, Get Good Drums, several orchestral sounds, and much, much more. From there, I use SSD4 from Steven Slate Drums. I've been using it for 10 years, still love it. I have to use Logic Pro and Rosetta, unfortunately, in order to use it, but it still works, so I'm, I'm not mad at that. Ozone from Isotope for my mastering, and Golfoz for my overall EQing. I have auto-tune and several vocal plugins, especially some stuff from Waves and guitar effects from Waves as well. So for that reason alone, I knew I couldn't really rely on 512 gigabytes. Not that I couldn't fit all of it on there, but I wanted to make sure I had extra space in order for the computer to actually run well. So the decision that I made was that I was going to have all the base programs on the internal SSD, the 512 gigabytes. So, you know, obviously downloading Final Cut on there, downloading Logic on there, downloading all my programs on there, internal plugins and that kind of stuff. But any additional sounds or virtual plugins, if I could help it, would go on on an external SSD drive. After the installation of the latest macOS Ventura and downloading FCP and Logic Pro from the App Store, my internal hard drive sits at around 343 gigs of available space, which is still plenty. And all of my plugins and virtual instruments, along with the library of sounds from Logic Pro, are hosted on a two terabyte Samsung T7 external SSD drive. With it directly connected into one of the four Thunderbolts on the back of the Mac Mini and using Blackmagic's disk speed test, I'm getting around 700 megabytes a second read and write speeds, which I honestly think is more than enough. I also have a much slower 12 terabyte Western digital drive that's connected via USB 3. This is the drive that I use when I want to get assets from a prior video and recycle it or get sounds from a prior project and recycle it for like another project or something like that. And I want it on hand and I don't want to have to dig into old hard drives to try to find it. This hard drive kind of does the job for me. And using the disk speed test from Blackmagic, I'm getting about 100 megabytes read and write from this drive, which again, 
is totally fine because I'm not using it to really read anything off of. It's just simply storage for me. Now, I know there are solutions like the Satachi Hub, which I'm actually very interested in trying, but for what I wanted to do and to keep it as cost effective as possible, I couldn't justify the extra $100 cost to get the drive and then an additional $80 to $100, $100 or $150 to get the drive to put in the Satachi Hub. I already had the Samsung T7 SSD drive. I already had the 12 terabyte Western Digital drive. So this solution, again, with the read and write speeds that I'm getting, totally works for me. Like any computer though, transferring all of my virtual instruments, my plugins, my effects took several days. But after getting everything working, I was recording stuff in Logic Pro. I was using contact plugins. I was using SSD4. I was using Goldfoss for my EQing. I was using Ozone for my mastering. And I had the IO buffer size at 256 samples and everything worked just great. I'm recording everything to that Samsung T7 SSD. It's actually getting the sounds from there as well. So it's kind of doing double duty, but it's working flawlessly for me so far. Now, how does it perform in programs like Logic Pro and Final Cut? Well, this is a song that I have recorded in Logic Pro. It is a song with 65 tracks, some of them live. There's some live drums in here, some of them mixed with SSD drums. There's some contact stuff in here. There's some regular synth stuff from Logic in here. There's some vocals on here with auto-tune and other stuff on here. And so, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty big project, all coming directly from the Samsung S7 internal two terabyte or external two terabyte SSD drive. I have the IO buffer size at 256. I like working in 256. I don't, I, I, I it doesn't give me a, a delay or anything like that. That's that noticeable to me. So I, I'm perfectly comfortable in 256. I can also work in 128. Uh, 64, I don't really work in, nor 32 for that matter. I don't, I don't think this computer is strong enough to do that. But 256 is, I'm more than happy with. And so what I'll do is I'll just play a little bit of this. Now you won't be able to hear this for copyright reasons, but we'll just, We'll just play it here. Okay, so this part of the song, it's playing right now. Everything's going well. We're in 44.1 kilohertz. We're three minutes into the song. And this section of the song has all of these drum tracks playing. It's got all of this virtual instruments going on as well. It's got the gold fuzz. It's got ozone doing its thing and it's working perfectly well. No starts, no stops, no nothing. So this is about a four minute song. We're gonna export it as a wave file 24 bit 44 one and we're gonna see how long this is gonna take i'm not mad at that that took 31 seconds 31 seconds for a four minute song to bounce with 60 plus tracks like i said we've got the mastering plugins on there we've got the eq plugins on there we've got virtual instruments we've got live drums the whole night so i'm not mad at that at all so now let's open up final cut pro now i'm not going to close logic i'm going to leave logic open in the background here Okay, so I opened up Final Cut Pro. Here is my timeline for my iPad Mini versus iPad Pro video. So you kind of get a little behind the scenes of how that video was put together. Oh, this is a video that was filmed in 4K. If you look over here, 3840 by 2160, uh, filmed in 4K with the Sony ZV-1 camera that I'm actually filming on right now. So not the most like, you know, intensive uh, camera or codec or anything like that, but you, you can see I'm scrubbing through uh, 4K timeline very, very easily right now. So this is a real world YouTube video that's nine minutes and 28 seconds. Now I'm going to stop the screen recording because I believe that if I'm screen recording and exporting, it actually won't export. So I'm gonna stop the screen recording, but I will time it and let you know how long it takes to export this video. Nine minutes and 28 seconds. Now I like exporting my stuff in H.264, it just saves me a hard drive space. So we're gonna see how long it's gonna take to not only export a nine and a half minute long video, but also convert it to H.264 from the original settings of the timeline. Okay, that nine minute and 30 second video uh, was not even rendered, so it rendered it, exported it, and then converted it to H.264 in five minutes and 37 seconds. That's actually not terrible. I'm not mad at that at all. Not only is the M2 Pro Mac Mini uh, 512 gigabytes good enough as far as space is concerned, it's definitely powerful enough to handle your basic projects for Final Cut Pro and definitely your projects for Logic Pro as well. So in conclusion, is 512 gigabytes enough? Well, it really depends on your workflow, but for just under $1,100, I don't know how you find a better solution for a computer that's going to give you all of this power in such a beautifully small form factor. This is truly my favorite desktop that Apple makes, and I'm so happy to have it back in my setup.